any one of us who said, shouldn't we consider having diplomatic relations with Beijing? Looks like the capital of quite a large country. They appear to have had a rather large revolution. There seems to be a lot of people living there. We're in a country with, no, what, who, what are you, some kind of a communist or a faggot? What is this? No, no, we'll do the door opening, thanks very much. To rescue what? To rescue our faces from the shame we've inflicted on the country in, in Vietnam to try and drive a wedge between China and Russia, to try and be clever that way, and to try and get a photo op and get on the nightly news. But we could only do it through the intercession of a dictator. We couldn't ask Congress to help. We couldn't ask the diplomatic service to help. We couldn't tell the State Department about it. It's a hasty thing. It's a racketeering covert operation. It's the opening to China. You notice the opening to China still hasn't taken place? There is no transparency in US-China relations. Nothing of the sort. Uh, have you ever been asked Hey, about that opening to China, I'd say worth the lives of three million Bengalis, wouldn't you? On any day. No, of course you've never been asked that. That's what it did take. That's what they thought it was worth. That's what they think of you, that you might swallow such a thing. But think of the sycophancy of the press in the way that it always talks about this. My profession has made this man, this assassin, this common murderer, this accomplice in mass murder, and genocide, this accomplice in the breaking of American law, in the violation of the American Constitution, in the subversion of an American election, in the killing of many, many people much better than himself, to please a boss, Richard Nixon, the thought of whom in power now makes everybody gag, would make a maggot gag when you think about it. There's my prose going again. <laughs> This man is the independent, detached, neutral commentator on events on ABC News Nightline. He's the syndicated columnist for the Los Angeles Times and the Washington Post. He's the honored guest at Tina Brown and Harry Evans and Mortimer Zuckerman's dinner parties and cocktails in New York. So it's a huge indictment of a, of a, of a craft, a trade. I won't, call, I won't call journalism a profession quite yet but of a calling that is, of which I'm, I haven't completely despaired. A very big indictment of that and of the role it plays in our culture. And I have much more to say about that if asked. And it's also tremendous, if I say this for myself, what I, what the implication of what I say at any rate is a, a, an enormous reproach to that fantastically overfed and complacent group, the American human rights community which is now almost a state within the state. In Washington, I think I could probably go every night of the week if I cared to and eat for free at a dinner where one human rights group gives an award to another <laughs> for its own bravery and courage. In New York, you could do it at lunchtime too, most days. <laughs> human rights prizes for journalists, human rights prizes for retired diplomats, human rights prizes for other human rights groups, human rights round robins, full-page advertisements in the New York Times, all of them tending to the view that the United States really must do more about the situation in Sri Lanka, or, um, which, by the way, it ought to, or practically anywhere else you can name except the West Bank of the Jordan River, and I'm in enough trouble for now. To, I'm not going to get into that right away. <laughs> um, but there in the middle of Manhattan, where they meet for these dinners and give themselves the prizes and the awards, is the man that I hope I've persuaded you they might be taking, uh, or should by now have taken, another look at, and it will be to really, really terribly to our shame if the task of bringing him to justice, him to justice, and doing justice for the victims is left to the victims themselves. We must swear we can and will do better than that. Thank you. Thanks very much. The lady asks, she remembers a lot of this too, did she miss anything or did nobody in 71 or so um, make any of these kinds of point? The answer is, and I, I don't want to seem as if it all depends on me because it does not. As I say in my book, I'm standing on the shoulders of a lot of people who tried to investigate it, um, that a, a good deal of work was done by the church committee, for example, a good deal of work was done by Seymour Hirsch and some other reporters in Washington, especially on Chile, but that the extent and depth of it wasn't known until very recently. In fact, it's, I mean, I've been doing this for years in Washington, for 20 years now. It's only when Congressman Hinchy 
last year in an amendment for Congress insisted as a rider to the bill of appropriations that the CIA disgorge everything it had on Chile. It, this is in response, by the way, to the arrest of, of Pinochet and the implications of that, which are the things that are worrying Kissinger now. And that amendment passed, and to everyone's surprise, the CIA just complied. They gave us all the stuff. And I didn't know, I was sure, but I didn't know until then, that you, we would find that they had paid off the people who killed Schneider. We even have the amount of dollars they gave them, and when and where. And, and the point of, in, the, in, the, in the ocean off Valparaiso where they threw the guns to conceal the evidence. We know it all now. That's why people, the, the relatives can sue if they want to. Because you can't just sue on, in general, any more than the British Special Branch could be told to go around. This is an, an event I'd really love to have seen, I must say. They weren't, to, they weren't told, um, go around to the clinic in London and arrest the Chilean junta. They were told, go around, you've got a warrant, go around to Mr. Pinochet's place and tell him he's nicked. Are you Augusto Pinochet? Si. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have here a warrant for your arrest. You may... You may remain silent, but everything you say can be taken down and bloody well used in evidence against you. I would love to have seen that. And then two months of house arrest where he's only allowed to see Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> which might not be cruel, but certainly unusual. <laughs> Better still, because I was terrified when the British let him go on humanitarian grounds. Because I know that the humanitarian grounds are the last thing that weigh with them. But better, he's in, on trial in Chile now. That's much better. So, I'm asked to comment on the following uh, objection, really. Is there not a danger in um, focusing on Henry Kissinger in ignoring the fact that he's the, one of many executives of a policy of imperialism? You wouldn't find in me a very strong opponent of that view. But I would stipulate that, uh, for example when it came a time to pay off the mortgage of the Vietnam uh, secret deal that I talked about at the beginning. Not many people in the Nixon administration were privy to that deal. Okay. And one of the things that was necessary for them to redeem it with the South Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese partners was to pretend, what everyone in the political establishment had long since ceased to pretend, that the uh, National Liberation Front of South Vietnam was not an indigenous force, right? that it was somehow... Vietnamese infiltrating Vietnam from some other country, which was thought by most, most of the policy establishment to be a fantasy by then, and was. But the fantasy had consequences. It meant, ah, but we could dry up this infiltration if we invaded Cambodia and Laos and bombed it flat, and then these other it would be less trouble. Well, it has to be said for their, to their credit that Melvin Laird, the Secretary of Defense, and William Rogers, the Secretary of State, said, that's ridiculous. We're not going to invade Cambodia. Anyway, it's a violation of international law. There was a big argument within the administration about whether to do it. Bebe Rebozo, Nixon's mafia chum, got on the phone. We have the records of that thanks to Kissinger because he was so suspicious. He's helped us a lot. He, never, he, he had himself bugged to make sure he had the record. Nixon and Rebozo on the eve of the invasion ring Kissinger drunk, blind drunk, and slur into the phone and say... We're going to go ahead, never mind state, never mind defense, but if it fails, Henry, they slurred into the phone. If it fails, it's your ass. That's why, that's why Kissinger kept tapes, because that's the sort of people he was working for. Did he go with Rogers and Laird and say maybe we shouldn't do this? No, he went with Nixon and Raposo. He made the difference.